Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about the SMRT back power sequencing, which is a very decent technique used on long read sequencing and it is also very accurate. So let's dive in. So before we talk about SMRT back power sequencing, Let's just take an idea about what sequencing is all about. I'm pretty sure that you guys already know about that, but let's just still take an overview. So if this is your input DNA, the first long string, the, and if the amount of DNA that you have is actually not sufficient, then you can clone that DNA using PCR or some other chain reactions, and you can then get enough of the DNA that you require. After that, you need some technique to randomly cut the DNA into small pieces because currently there is no sequencing technique that can actually read the entire DNA accurately from beginning to end. They can only read small fragments of DNA. That is why you have to do this. So understand that this segmentation or this fragmentation can actually differ between the different sequencing platforms so it can be different from for Illumina sequencing. It can be different for SMRT back bar sequencing as well. Now, obviously we have these fragments. Now we have to know what is there in these fragments. So what is the sequence associated with this fragment and so on and so forth. So by sequence, I mean the string containing A, T, C and G. So the sequencing techniques are vastly different on how this process is achieved. So how we read these fragments is the main differentiating point between the different sequencing platforms and techniques. So after we know which fragment actually represents which string, which DNA base string, we can use some computational algorithms to align them to the actual human reference genome. And then for each position, so each column here, you can think of it as one position. So in each position, there are multiple uh, fragments or reads aligned <clears throat> and we can sort of take their consensus to actually see what kind of base is there in each position and thus we can get the full uh, human DNA or your DNA or maybe the DNA of some other species right so now that we know what sequencing is let's talk about the SMRT pipe sequencing so first of all, SMRT means single molecule real time. So here you basically sequence one molecule, which is one fragment, one DNA fragment at a time inside one photonic chamber. So the photonic chamber is something which I'm going to discuss in detail. So don't worry about it. So it is a technique for long read sequencing where read length is several kilobases. So it can be two kilobase, 10 kilobase, and even 15 kilobase. But understand that very popular sequencing technique, Illumina. So Illumina is a very popular sequencing technique, but in that technique, you cannot actually sequence more than 500 to 600 bases. So that is a very big differentiating factor. So the fragments that are cut for Illumina needs to be very, very small, but uh, SMRT doesn't have that limitation. The accuracy is very high. So this is one of the key points here because there are other long read sequencing techniques as well, but their accuracy is not that high. It's a third generation sequencing and very recent. And the main problem is it's costlier. <clears throat> the main problem is it's costlier than short read sequencing techniques such as Illumina. Obviously it's going to be costly because you are doing long read and you are achieving a very high quality base call. So before we talk about the sequencing technique itself, we need to understand two things. One about physics, and one about biology because SMRT technique is composed of these two things, physics and biology. So let's go to with the physics first. So first of all, suppose this is a sheet and there is a small pinhole in the sheet. If you pass light here, the light will have some diffraction like this. Now, if the pin pinpoint or the pinhole is smaller, then the diffraction will actually increase as you can see right here. Now, if we decrease the pinhole further, if we decrease it to an extent where the pinhole is actually less than the wavelength, the diameter is less than the wavelength of light, the light cannot pass through it, but it will sort of like disseminate its electromagnetic wave around this whole place. This phenomenon has got a name. So the name is zero mode wave or ZMW guide. 
So why is zero mode wave important for us? Because if we actually put some molecule here, some fluorescent, some colored fluorescent here, it will light up basically. It will light up because of this zero mode wave phenomenon, right? So that is, this is something we need to keep in mind that if we give some fluorescent molecule right here, it will light up with its own color if this kind of setting is actually provided. So this is the physics part. It was pretty simple, I know. Next, let's go with the biology part. So in biology part, we need to understand how DNA replication happens. So what is DNA replication? DNA replication is the process of creating a new DNA from the mother DNA. So this double-stranded DNA that you can see right here, my, if you follow my cursor right here, it is the mother DNA. So the mother DNA will actually break down into two single strands. And then let's just focus on one strand, right? Let's focus on this particular strand above. So there is this enzyme in human body called DNA polymerase. If DNA polymerase sees a lot of bases like A, T, C, G, free nucleotides floating around, which actually happens to float around in human body, it will use those to actually reconstruct the complementary strand. So this is the complementary strand and you can, you can you pretty much know that A always joins with T, C always joins with G. So the entire like process is actually very deterministic. We know exactly which base the DNA polymerase will actually create in order to construct this complementary strand. And so, so after the construction is done, this will be a full DNA, a full child DNA, double-stranded. And same logic goes for this strand below as well. So from one mother DNA, in this way, two children are created. So why do we actually care about this? So understand that if we somehow can follow this uh, construction procedure of the DNA polymerase, we can know exactly which bases were there in the original strand, right? So suppose if we know that this base is T, I mean the constructed base by the DNA polymerase right here, the green one maybe, suppose, the green one is cytosine. So we know that the original base was what? ATCG. So it's going to be G, right? It's going to be the complementary G. Similarly, if the DNA polymerase is constructing an adenine, we know that the complementary is what? Thiamine, right? The T base. So in this way, if we, if we can somehow follow the DNA polymerase synthesis step, then we can actually essentially guess what is the DNA sequence. I mean, not the DNA sequence, what is the sequence in the DNA fragment? Because we are going to do this at fragment level. So this is basically the biology you need to understand. So just to give you a hint, if we want to follow along this procedure, we need to use some fluorescent with each of the floating bases. And using the idea that we discussed in the previous slide, which is based on the pinhole principle, we can actually light up that fluorescent and can record which light actually lit up. So don't worry if you didn't understand what I'm saying now. I'm going to discuss this in more detail in the next slides. Now let's get an overview of how we can, we can actually sequence the DNA using the SMRT sequencing. So first of all, we obviously create fragments because the sequencing technique cannot actually read the whole DNA. It's too long. Typically, the fragments are around 15 to 20 kilobase long and they are all double stranded. Okay, fine. Now let's talk about just one fragment. Let's, I mean, the process to read each fragment is exactly the same. So let's talk about only one fragment. So let's say this is the one fragment we want to talk about. So what, what is done here in this technique is an adapter, which is basically a short DNA sequence, is actually attached to both ends of the complementary strands. So this is called a hairpin adapter. Why? Because it actually can create a loop. So I'm going to show you the loop right now. If you heat this thing up, if you anneal or heat this thing up, then this will happen. I mean, the double strand will actually break down into single strands and these two hairpin adapters, they will loop around this place. They will create this loop. They will, they will get stuck to the both ends. This will stuck to these both ends and this adapter will stuck to the both ends. So this is called circular SMRT bell template. Now, obviously we're wondering why exactly do we need the circular bell template? Why couldn't we just work with the like straight, I mean, just, just the linear fragments or the, or the linear strands? Why do we need to make this loop? Actually, there is a reason for it. So there is something called circular consensus sequencing in SMRT. So let me explain that. So if you apply DNA polymerase enzyme, and if you provide the free bases, ATCG, and in the environment, the DNA polymerase will use those 
to create the complementary strand for the entire circular template, right? I mean, as we saw in the previous slide, I mean, this is the process that DNA polymerase does. It tries to create, create a complementary strand. Now, if this weren't circular, if this were just linear, I mean, just, just a linear thing, no circle, no loop, then this creation process, this complementary strand creation process would only occur once. So there would be only one pass. And since this is a long read sequencing technique, it is error prone. And if you get only one copy, if you get only one read of the fragments, of the fragment itself, then it may not be that accurate. You ideally want many copies of that. So if it is circular, then it actually creates many copies because this DNA polymerase just keeps circling around. It's a natural process. It will keep circling around, creating the complementary strain multiple times. And there will be like two to 10 passes normally. And you can basically record that very long created complementary strand. And you can sort of take the consensus of the multiple copies, right? Because this, the complementary strand of this blue part, which is the forward strand, will be created 10 times if there are 10 passes. And the complementary strand of this reverse strand will also be created 10 times. So if there are 10 passes. So from those 10 copies, you can take the consensus and you can sort of understand what exactly was the base in each position. So it's a very simple technique, but very ingenious. It's a very ingenious technique. But now the question that you have in your mind is, when the DNA polymerase is creating the complementary strand, how do we exactly follow along the procedure? How do we follow whether it is creating A, T, C, or G in each step? That is what I'm going to answer right now. So understand that we can actually adjoin or join, basically we can attach fluorescent molecules to each of the bases which are like moving freely in our environment. I mean, in the environment where we are actually working on this procedure, this uh, DNA polymerase synthesis procedure, we are going to have to make sure that there are plenty of free bases floating around there. And those bases will have some fluorescence attached to it. Now, each base will have a different colored fluorescent. For example, A has green and C has the orange fluorescent. So I'm just oversimplifying things here because this is be circular, definitely. I'm just showing you a linear part. I'm, so you can think of this as, as a sub part of the circular string, A, A, C, G, C, G, D. So what will happen if this is our original sequence? Then this will be created by the DNA polymerase. And when T will be created, the purple light will turn on. When T will be created again, purple light will turn on and so on and so forth. And understand that each base synthesis takes a few microseconds, which is enough for the machine to actually record the lighting that occurred during those 10 to 20 microseconds. So the machine will know which lights were turned on in which sequence. And from that, we can infer the original blue sequence. Now, the question is, will the light just turn on automatically? No, it will not turn on automatically. You will have to give it some electromagnetic field for it to actually light up. So how will you do that? So this is the photonic chamber that I just mentioned in the very first slide. So a photonic chamber is just a pinhole on a sheet, which is covered with glass. So the blue part right here is glass. And above there is a well-shaped thing where we have the DNA polymerase enzyme and the circular sequence. So when, the, when each base is being created, that base, I mean, has the fluorescent. And when it comes near the pinhole, it lights up because of the electromagnetic field created by the Z and W. So this we discussed in the previous slide. So if you want a more realistic image, this is how it looks like. So if the DNA polymerase enzyme is trying to construct a G base, then there will be a very bright yellow light lit up right here because of the presence of this pinhole and the light coming in, in through it. Because the pinhole is so small, there will be an electromagnetic field, which is because of the Z and W effect that we talked about earlier. Okay, so now we actually know how exactly one single fragment or one single DNA molecule is sequenced using SMRT packed biosequencing. But obviously you know that there are a lot of DNA fragments that will be created by our fragmentation process. So for example, if we just go back to the previous slide, so you can see this very long DNA and many plenty of fragments that are being created. Right. So if we do this sequentially, one fragment after another, it can take a lot of time. So I will now show you the exact machine, like the inside of the exact machine that is 
used to do it. So this is what it looks like. So you can see that on this sheet, there are plenty of pinholes. I mean, this is a subset of the sheet because in the sheet, normally there are thousands of pinholes. Now you have this class above it. So basically the class is put on top of this. And then you have these wells. So these each of these are wells. So there are many wells, right? So we talked about the photonic chamber. Each well is just a photonic chamber. And inside each photonic chamber, we have the DNA polymerase enzyme. So these purple ones, they are basically poured in the in each photonic chamber. So now I think you can take a guess what's happening. So in each photonic chamber, we are going to put one DNA molecule or one fragment, and we are going to perform the reading procedure. When the reading procedure will be over, we are going to put new DNA fragments and so on and so forth. So the whole thing is run in parallel. So thousands of fragments are processed in parallel at a single time. So that is exactly what SMRT backbone sequencing is. I think this will probably be the clearest video on this topic. I was also trying to learn this from different sources. If you like the video, feel free to subscribe and share. And we have a donation link also in the description and in the first comment. So if you like the video, you can donate to our channel and support the effort that we are trying to put for your own benefit. Thank you very much. See you in the next video.